tonight at 5 o'clock and 6. All right, let's have a good number in God's house, especially as we continue on this evening. Sanctification, all right, will be the word uh, for tonight. So if you want to read a little bit about that, sanctification. That's one of those big church words, and I'm going to tell you what it means. It's more of a process, but we'll talk about that tonight. But this morning, I want you to turn to one of the most familiar, I guess, passages of Scripture when it comes to talking to someone about a conversion, about salvation, about regeneration, about forgiveness or repentance. All of those things come into play in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, okay? And you hold your spot there when you find that in Ephesians 2 and 8 because I want to also uh, read verse 9 here in just a little bit. But Ephesians chapter 2 and, and verse 8, okay? We have to get this. Uh, this morning we have to understand it. We have to know what it means because this is sort of the one of those verses that is a bedrock of Christianity, of what we stand for. And I don't want you to be ignorant of it. I want you to have a full understanding of what Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. If you're there, uh, then you can highlight that and mark that in your Bible. It's somewhere where you need to be able to get to quickly, uh, especially when it comes to maybe talking about someone about salvation, okay? And that is our main goal. It always is. Above all else, the reason that we're here this morning is once again to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in hopes that someone would make Christ the Lord of their life. Now, there are other reasons why we're here. Certainly there is. We're here to fellowship one with another. We're here to unify our hearts together in service to God. We're here to teach and to preach and to study uh, and so that we can learn and become more knowledgeable about God's Word. We're certainly here uh, to worship God in spirit and in truth, and we've done that this morning in our singing uh, through our prayers. We've done all kinds of things uh, in just the short time that we've been here. We don't do any of them out of habit, but we do them because we want to give God the glory that he so richly deserves. But above all uh, and none uh, comes second uh, to the reason that we're here is to bring honor and glory to God by bringing someone to him by means of salvation, okay? And I can't do that for you you can't do it for yourself. Salvation is of the Lord. And so we want to preach and teach uh, about how to do that. So we go back to the very basic this morning. Uh, many of these verses that we're going to give to you, you've probably read a thousand times. But it's still valuable for us to look at what God's Word has to say. I want to preach this morning about a salvation that does not save. Well, it's not salvation at all. A salvation that does not save cannot be salvation. You're right. If you got that right off the bat, you could leave this morning. Now, you don't, you don't get to leave, but you could leave because you already know that a salvation that does not save is not salvation at all. And so I'm going to show you in God's Word how that the world is trying to entrap so many people into thinking that they have salvation, and in the end, it's no salvation at all. And so Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, but what does it say? Salvation is a what? It's a gift of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, I wrote in your outline, and I want you to know and understand this. And no, I'm not trying to start any kind of a movement. In the world that we live today, you can go outside of the walls of this church, and just so quickly, you can join some type of movement. If you're a lady, you can join a women's movement. If you're a man, maybe you could join a man's movement. If you want to go out and join a movement about social injustice, you can find that too. Whatever it is that maybe you would embark upon out there, you can find a movement that will go in that direction. We've got movements for everything. People that are out standing up against 
something or standing for something, you can join a movement. You can go on the internet and you can find a list of movements out there and pick a movement that you want to join. But I'm telling you this, that Christians must stand firm this morning on one thing. Well, there's many things, but I want to highlight one of them this morning, and I wrote it there, is that we cannot be tempted into trying to find common ground when it comes to salvation. Salvation has got to be the thing that we say is that it is of God, it is by God, it is through God, and there cannot be any changes made to it. Now, we might get more modern, we might get more technical, we might get more advanced, and the term that the world likes to use, we might get more progressive, but what we read in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 will never change. Is that salvation is by grace through faith and that you can't work to get it. It's a gift that God wants to give you. And so salvation is what we refer to as a non-negotiable. It's not up for debate. I'm not here this morning to debate with you about how that you can be saved. I'm not up for a debate or an argument or a fight. Sometimes I love to get in a good argument or a good debate. Well, me and the boys do that all the time. On the way home, we have, we have debates all the time. I mean, I've got three boys that love to be right, and they've got a dad that does too. And we can fight all the way home about who the greatest player is or what the greatest song is or who the greatest actor is or the greatest movie. We can debate about all kinds of trivial, silly little things. But there's one thing I will not stand and debate or argue or fuss over or try to uh, come to some common ground, and that's salvation. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Salvation is a non-negotiable in our church. It is a non-negotiable in Christianity. And we can't let the world and what the world is trying to do, and it will not work, but we can't begin to make deals with the world when it comes to salvation. Let me give you some biblical proof of that. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Sarah will put this verse up, and I want you to look up here, and I want you to read it. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other." For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's a non-negotiable. It's not up for debate. You may come and you may say, well, Jody, what if, what if I believe in something else? Then, my friend, you can't go where Christ is. Well, can I get to heaven believing in another God? No. Well, why not? That's not fair. You may say, it's not fair. I want to believe what I want to believe and I still want to go where you are going to go. Well, my friend, if you want to go where I'm going, you got to believe what I believe. And that's the facts of the matter. I didn't make the path, Christ did. And so we have here where the Bible makes it very clear to us, neither is there salvation in any other. Bottom line, neither is there salvation in any other where there is, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What is that name? The name of Christ. My friend, Jesus went to the cross of Calvary and died for the sins of the whole world. The Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Dying doesn't mean you go to heaven. If dying meant that you went to heaven, everybody that died would now be in heaven. And we know that's not true. How do we know that's not true? We have examples in the Word of God where folks have died and lifted up their eyes. One man, the Bible says, he lifted up his eyes in torment. 
Not because he was resting in the presence of God, but because he had fell into eternal damnation in hell. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Not everyone that dies goes to heaven. Well, who gets to go to heaven? Is it the lucky ones? Luck has nothing to do with it. Is it a lottery that some get to go and some don't? No, it's not a lottery at all. The Bible says that you have the opportunity today to make your calling and election sure. Someone told me yesterday of someone who's not much older than me who was making plans in this life to do some things and um, was going to get married and was going to do some other things and just enjoy, no doubt, had a lot of plans in life and those plans fell short yesterday morning. Why? Because he died. And it was a shock. It was a shock to me. It was a shock to people who knew him close. I just knew of him through someone else. But I word come to me, they said, did you hear? And I said, what, what is it? And they said, he died. Well, when I think of someone my age, not to say that I'm a spring chicken, but I'm certainly not of the age yet to where death is upon us quite frequently, as some of you are. And all the old people said, hush, don't remind us. But when they said he died, I thought, he's not supposed to die. He's not of the age to die. He wasn't sick to die, but yet he died. And now the calling and election is passed. The choice had to be made prior to that time. Now, I don't know what he, if he was a person of faith. I don't know that he had uh, surrendered his heart to Christ. I, I have no idea. I just, like I said, I just knew him very vaguely through someone else. But he died. Not everyone that dies goes to heaven. But those that have made Christ the Lord of their life, by his grace, they are saved. By grace, through faith, and not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Now, here's what the world wants to tell you. Well, let me say this. Thomas asked Jesus one time, said, Well, Christ, if you're going away and we want to go to where you're going, this place you're talking about, because Jesus said, I, I'm, going to, I'm going away and I'm going to prepare a place. And he started talking about mansions. And then the disciples began to ponder, well, if he, that's where he's going, how do we get there? We want to go. I mean, Christians ought to want to be in the presence of Christ. Where Christ is, that's where we should desire to be. I mean, now that the church is assembled this morning, on the Lord's Day, all Christians across this world should have a desire in their heart to want to get to a local church and fellowship and worship and pray and, and celebrate our salvation with other believers. This is not a time to sit on the couch. It's not a time to lay under the sheets. It's not a time to find a lake to catch fish or a trail to ride a four-wheeler. My friend, this is the Lord's day. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And if you're glad to be here this morning, then my friend, you're just like King David. But yet the dread that comes upon some people when they know that it's church time and now they've got to make a decision. Do I really want to go today? What do you mean? What do you mean? Christ has saved you. Look what He's done for you. He's kept you. Some of you, Christ has reached down and pulled you out of death's jaws. Some of you, you were a vagrant. You were in the ditch. You were addicted. You were messed up. You had, had more relationships and failed relationships than the woman at the well. And look at you now, what God has done for you. And so when the church bell rings, you ought to be the first on the pew. And you ought to sing, hey, let's sing three. Let's don't sing two. Let's sing three. Because God has done so much for me. He has done so much for me, therefore I am glad. And so we come this morning to 
Well, let me tell you what Thomas said. Thomas said, Lord, give me a map. I had a friend the other day. I don't know how many people have been to Ollie's. We got, a, we got a new store in town. And I tell you, Ollie's is confusing to me. Because I, I don't know really what the purpose of going there for. Really, I don't know what I would need that I would want to go there. But when I got there, I realized that probably whatever I need, they got. You just got to find it. And, and they say sometimes they have it, sometimes they don't. And, I, I, and, and the first thing we went in, I was with one of my friends, and they, they said, I, I want to go. I said, well, I, I'll go too. It was lunch, and we was just out running around. And I said, I'll go too. And they said, I said, what are you going to get there? They said, I want an atlas. And that, like, a, like, a, like the old things, like that old people used before they had technology and, and, and maps on phones and th- your car spoke to you? Yeah, that. I said, okay. So we went into Ollie's and sure enough, right there to the right was one of the big old atlases that you would pack around in your car and if you got lost, you would open that big thing and you barely could see through the windshield because the atlas is so big. And so we went in there and she got her an atlas, and on her way back, I said, well, let me open that up. I said, I'll find out if we're getting the quickest way back to the office. And so Thomas said, well, Lord, I need a map. If you're going away and we want to go where you're going, how do we get there? Jesus made it very simple. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. My friend, Jesus is the door. If, if heaven is going to be your eternal home, Jesus has to be your Savior. And that's a non-negotiable. And anything outside of that, you're not going to heaven. And unfortunately, you're, you'll come up short in eternity. Let me repeat that one more time before we get into really the heart of the message, the second part of it. And that's to say this. If your heart's desire is to go to heaven... And one of these days you want to go to heaven. You've sung about it. You've prayed about it. You've talked about it. You've heard about it. If you really want to go to heaven at the end of this life, and I don't know when your life is going to come to an end. I don't know when my life is going to come to an end. But I know this, that the obituary column is full every day of people that didn't think that that day they were going to die. Amen? Now you can go by the graves and you can go by the cemeteries and you can go by the mausoleums and it don't matter if we put you in the ground or we bury your ashes. It does not matter. Your soul is going to live forever somewhere. And all of us have to make plans now to be where Jesus is going to be. And if you want to go to heaven, Jesus has got to be your Savior. And anything beside that, you're going to come up short. That's not Jody's rule. That's not Willow Fern rule. That's not Baptist rule. That's the Word of God. Amen? Let me tell you three things that the world is trying to sell to people that says you don't have to have salvation by grace through faith. They're saying this. You can have salvation in yourself. Your self-worth is good enough. We hear a lot about self-worth today, but I'm telling you that your self-worth is not good enough for heaven. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. Sarah doesn't have this verse. There's a reason for that. I want you to turn to this verse. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. Now you follow along. You're Bible scholars. You've got the Word of God right there with you. All right? And I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. Okay? And in 1 John 1 and 8 you're going to find where the Bible is going to call you a liar. Or you say, well, I don't like that. Well, I'm just telling you what the Word of God says, all right? So I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. And the Bible says this. Are you there? 1 John is way over in the New Testament, right? So you've got to find 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and then you're going to find the book of Revelation. Now, a lot of people know where Revelation is. Well, if you can find Revelation, just go back. There's three little uh, short books written by John, and I want you to find the first epistle of John and find the first chapter and verse 8 and verse 10. 
And the Bible says this. It's a hypothetical. As the writer is saying to us, if we say that we have no sin, we what? Oh, my friend, you deceive your own self. The devil has allowed you to convince your own self that you have no need of a Savior. You can do it on your own. And it says if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now I want you to look at verse 10, another hypothetical. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar and His Word is not in us. Well, how do we make God a liar? Because God is saying to us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then here you come in with your chest puffed out and your shoulders broad and you look proud and you say, who does God think he is? I'm good in my own self-worth. I've never sinned. I'm righteous in my own ways and I deserve to be in heaven. And the Bible says, wrong. Now the world may say yes. Let me tell you how this thing works in the end. You're not going to stand before the world. You're going to stand before God. And so, would you rather listen to the world who's going to tell you a lie and you'll be damned, or are you going to listen to God who wants to save your life and you'll live forever? And the Bible says if we confess, now look at this verse right in the middle of verse in, 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 in 8 and 10, right in the middle and in between is verse 9 that says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say we have no sin, if we say that we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. We make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. Don't come to me this morning, my friend, and tell me how good you are. Won't you come to me and tell me how good God is? That's what I want to hear. You don't need to hear about how good I am. You need to hear about how good God is. The Bible says... That Saul's disobedience, and I'm not going to minister this. It's a, there's another time for that. But but Saul got this ideal that he said to God, "I've I've got this." <laughs> and and any time we're dumb enough to say that, my friend, we're going to falter and fail. I mean, he looked at the God of heaven and earth who knows all things, seeth all things, who is the beginning and the end. I mean, the creator. I mean, he looked at God and said, God, you told me that the plan was this, but I've got a better plan. Because God said, destroy the enemy. Don't leave anything. Don't take anything. Destroy it. Flatten it. Annihilate it. Exonerate. I mean, get rid of it. And Saul says, I've got a better plan. Why don't we keep some of it and not utterly destroy it? And do you know what God said to him? I'm not interested in your plan. I'm interested in you being obedient to my plan. And because you was disobedient to my plan, take that crown off your head and I'm giving it to somebody else. And in steps David. Saul had the opportunity to be great but he couldn't get out of his own way. He could not get over the fact that sometimes he had a better plan than God. Charles Spurgeon said this, the greatest enemy to the human soul is the self-righteous spirit which makes men look to themselves for salvation. The greatest enemy to the human soul is the self-righteous spirit which makes people look to themselves for salvation. And people are doing it every single day. The third thing, I mean the second thing, and we only have three, but the second lie that the devil is trying to tell apart from that you can have salvation in yourself is that you can have salvation in the things that you have. Now a lot of us have things, some have more things than others, some have less things, but it does not matter. We've all got things, we've all got possessions, we've all got materials. We were on our way to church this morning. Peyton had gotten like a hundred bucks for his birthday. Mama always likes to sneak in and take a large part of those funds and put it into a bank account that she's got individualized for the boys. She's smart like that. 
And so she'll always say, all right, you've got $100 for your birthday. Why don't you give me 60 of it? I'll put it in the bank, and you take 40 and go buy you something. Now, sometimes they like that, sometimes they don't. But Peyton come in this morning as everyone was getting dressed, and he had a wad full of money. I didn't know it was his. I said, where'd you get that money? And Cassie said, no, that is his. That's his birthday money. And he was feeling of it one more time before uh, Mama snuck in and stole it all away. He knew that Mama was coming. He knew he has to go to Mama's to eat after church today. So he wanted to feel that money one more time before it goes to the bank. Well, he rode to church with me and he had two 20s in his hand when he got in the truck. That was his share. He knew he had said goodbye to the other 60. And now he had two 20s that rightfully he could say, that belongs to me. He threw those two 20s down in the console of the truck and he said, I'm just going to keep these right here. And I said, oh, did you bring that to put in the offering? We got about halfway here. I said, what about that? Are you going to put that in the offer? And he said, Dad, that's $20. That's $20. He said, if it was 10 maybe I would. He wouldn't put 10 in. Because then he would have said, maybe 5 And then he's going to be like, oh, good Baptists do. And finally gets down to a dollar. It's a pretty good show for a dollar. But we love to hold on sometimes to our possessions. The Bible says, take heed and be aware of covetousness. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 15, the Bible says that Christ said these words that we all need to follow. That a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Amen? Your happiness does not come from your things. And if your happiness does come from the things that you own, then your happiness will be short-lived. If what you own is the only reason that you have to smile, then my friend, you won't be smiling very long. Because everything we have is short-term, the best we can do. That's it. And so the Bible says that we have to endure this temptation of Satan when Satan comes knocking at the door and says, Hey, don't listen to Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of your works, lest any man should boast. All you've got to do is run out here into the world, climb the corporate ladder, knock everyone out of the way, cheat and beat and bang and claw and get as much money as you can, get as much possessions as you can, accumulate as many things as you can, and that's all you need. And you may think that sounds silly. You may think that sounds dumb. But my friend, I'm telling you that the world is more attracted to things now than it ever has been. I mean, my papa grew up in a time where he was poor, but he said we didn't know we were poor because everybody else was poor too. He said we didn't know, we, didn't, we were so poor, we didn't know we were poor because everybody was poor with us. I guess if you're going to be poor, the best way to be is for everybody to be poor with you. And yet now we have, we have fallen in love. What have we fallen in love with? Things. The rich fool. Again, I'm not going to minister this, but you can go read it in Luke chapter 12. He, he, God had blessed him with so much. And, and instead of being satisfied with what he had, instead of doing good with all the possessions that he had, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with possessions. There's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. I think a lot of times we cast a bad light on them as if people have to go around here and feel guilty for their success or feel guilty for their education. And that's not true at all. I want our young people to pursue an education. I want them to have a great career. I want them to be able to afford uh, the things that they want. I, I want all of those things for them. The Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil, but it says the love of money is the root of all evil. 
A dollar bill has never sent one soul to hell, but the love of it has. Amen? And so that man said, I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger. And then here come God and God said, thou fool, you're going to die tonight. And by the way, when God says it's over, it's over. And God told that man, he said, it's over. It's over for you tonight, pal. Your number is called. And the Bible says that that man was ill prepared for it to be over. Because all of his passion was in things that were going to go to somebody else. His love, his salvation was in his possessions. And in turn, it ended up being that it was a salvation that did not save. And a salvation that does not save is no salvation at all. Thirdly, and maybe we could spend a month on this. But the devil says, you don't need God. You don't need by grace are you saved through faith. Not of your works, lest any man should boast. You don't need that. If you'll do good, you'll be kind, you'll work it out, go to church, give of your tithes and offerings. If you'll do those things, do, 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 do. If you'll do things all of your life, then God will let you in. The Bible never says that. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Luke or in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 28, even so ye also outwardly, he said to these people, you appear righteous unto men. You appear righteous by the things you're doing and the things you're saying. But he said on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and sin. Hypocrisy and iniquity. You're rotten to the core. Oh, you, you put on a good facade. You, you put on a good exterior. But on the inside, you're rotten to the core. And while man may not be able to see what's on the inside, God knows what's on the inside. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 9 says, Who can say, I have made my heart clean? What one of us here this morning can say, and by the way, that's a, that's a wonderful verse. And I think maybe I've read that before and kind of skimmed over it now. It's almost as if this morning, I mean, it, it just stuck out to me as one of the greatest verses ever. And I thought, where has that been all of my life? And, and God was saying, it's there. You just need to read it. In Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 9, ask the question, who among you can say, I have made my heart clean? Can you clean your heart? Can you wipe away your sins? Can you work out your salvation? Well, let me tell you this. The Bible says in Acts chapter 16, there was a jailer that said to two disciples of God, said, what must I do to be saved? And those disciples didn't respond. You need to go do this, or you need to go do that, or you need to obey the Ten Commandments, or you need to put 10% in the offering plate. Didn't, you didn't, he didn't say you need to go join a church, or you need to be a deacon, or you need to be a pastor. He didn't say any of those things. But he said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So I, I want to say, as, and I heard, I think it was Spurgeon maybe, And I wrote this down. I didn't write who said it. But he said, the great preacher said, Our plea to God cannot be righteousness. Our plea to God has to be guilt. We can't come to God and offer righteousness. All we've got is guilt. When you come to God, the day that you come to God, you could bring no righteousness to the table. Now, all that you you have at that time, all that you had at that moment was guilt. You can't bring righteousness. You don't have righteousness. And I know that's hard pill to swallow. I understand that. But my friend, righteousness is only by God and through Him. So we we didn't have righteousness. All we had was guilt. And thank God that's all He wants. He wants our guilt. I say this when we come to a close. John Newton, 
He said, although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. The two things are this. One, I am a great sinner. And two, that Christ is a great Savior. He said, I am old, my memory is fading, but I know and I remember two things very clearly. One is that I am a great sinner, and two, Christ is a great Savior. Amen? And thank God for that. Stand with us this morning all over God's house as we give somebody the opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of their life. And if you're here this morning,